All right. Uh, thank you all for being here uh, this evening. Oh. My name is Kirk Irwin. I am uh, the director of Friday Arts Project. And to remind everyone, I was reminded of this tonight, we're not just on Fridays. We're not doing, if you notice, today's Thursday, so we're doing something on Thursday. Okay. <laughs> Friday Arts Project uh, is uh, an organization that um, started in 2006 at Winthrop University. And the um, uh, the mission statement is that it, it is an arts collective curating conversation and fostering craft to call forth a fully human community. If you'd like to know more about that, we have over here on the bar behind the drink refrigerator uh, information about that. Now this is um, our first curator's codex in quite a while. Uh, curator's codex is something that we we're doing from time to time uh, as a way of that part of uh, curating conversation. That's why we call it select conversation in the arts. Uh, there are things that we want to say into the art world, into the culture, and we utilize our, our curator's codex for that. So we're, we're hoping that, uh, well, we believe that making and talking about the, art can make a, about the arts can make us better neighbors, and curator's codex helps us do that as we talk more about the arts. Um, so that we usually try and look for three individuals, types of individuals for our Curator's Codex. Um, there, it's easy, because it's three A's. We look for an artist, an academic, or an advocate. If, if they fill kind of one of those or both those roles, uh, then and we invite them to, if they want to speak into something regarding our culture and our art world, then we, uh, we love to have them do that. And we think Wes, uh, Wes Vanderlugd fits both the artist and advocate role rather well. So we think he has something to say and we hope what he says tonight and reads tonight may entice and challenge you and all of us to be better human beings. Wes is going to speak for about 30-ish, maybe a little bit more minutes, uh, read and, and interact with his, uh, his writing and then he'll take some Q&A after that and we'll see how it goes. And, uh, Anyway, he is, uh, just a little bit about Wes. He is the acting director of the Leighton Ford Center for Theology, the Arts, and Gospel Witness, and adjunct professor of theology at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary in Charlotte. Uh, he has his PhD in theology, imagination, and the arts from the University of St. Andrews in, in Scotland, I believe, right? That's, mm -hmm. And uh, enjoys writing and speaking on a variety of topics that uh, usually include uh, Things like beauty, spiritual formation, the arts, uh, theology, and creativity. Uh, this is where some, not only his exercise as an artist in theater in particular, but also his advocacy can, can come out. He's the co-founder with his wife Stephanie of Kinship Plot, which is a community that is committed to learning collaboratively uh, by cultivating resonant relationships. You can uh, see more of their stuff online um, as well. He, we first connected with Wesley when he had his inaugural um, show, or his inaugural exhibition up at Gordon Conwell Seminary. And that was a show, it was all of female iconographers, right? It was a- Of Ukraine. Yeah, from Western Ukraine. And um, it was astonishing. It was amazing. I'd never seen iconography like that ever. It's, uh, it took on a kind of a new parallel to traditional iconography and uh, had very much uh, feminine expression as well, um, and, and which was really, really cool to see. So uh, Wesley has written several books on the topic uh, of theater and theology and where they cross, and his recent book, which he's reading from tonight, Beauty in, in, is Oxygen, he invites the reader to look at ways that the beauty of our lives influence and even guide us, and perhaps in ways we don't even see. And uh, so we'll hear a little bit about that from tonight. So. Uh, let's welcome up Wes Vanderlucht. Thank you, Kirk. And thank you all so much for coming. It means a lot that you would be interested in a topic like this. I love the arts of all kinds, and uh, I love to speak about the arts. And I'll do that a little bit tonight, but I, I kind of want to step back a little bit, too, and 
speak about this, this theme of beauty, which not everybody likes to talk about <laughs> in relation to the arts. It can be kind of a divisive thing to talk about, a little squishy thing to talk about. But I think it's really important for us to wrestle with this topic. And I guess what I want to ask you as a little teaser is just for you to try to imagine a world without beauty. I mean, try it. <laughs> try to imagine a world where every building looks the same. Every song sounds the same. Every meal tastes the same. Every interaction feels the same. Every plant smells the same. It's almost impossible, right? It's like not even a world. Can't imagine a world without that kind of significant form. And we can hardly imagine a world without beauty, which means we can't really, uh, um, a world without beauty would also be a world uh, without God, whose, I believe, whose unity and diversity is the source of all beauty. So if beauty is such an integral part of the world that we're in, the life that we live, then, then why is it that we often treat beauty as optional? Or why do we approach beauty as marginal or tangential to issues like flourishing and health, spiritual formation, community, worship, life, community? And to be fair, not everyone does that. And not every portions of the Christian tradition that I'm a part of does that. But I think, unfortunately, a lot of people do. And it's much more common than not to, to treat beauty more like perfume than like oxygen. So think about that. If beauty is like perfume, then it's something that's there to adorn my life, but not really to sustain it. We doing okay with this? Do I need to adjust something? All right. I can just talk louder, too, if I need to. <laughs> If beauty is like perfume, it's what I'm allowed to enjoy once I've figured out more necessary things, right? Like truth and morality and justice. I think if beauty is like perfume, it's something that's just subjective. It's, here's the perfume I like or the perfume that you like, and it's not something solid and objective like truth might be. And certainly it would mean that beauty is, is a luxury for the privileged and not something that's really necessary for everyone. Well, I don't think that's what beauty is. I think beauty is much more than that. And if beauty is oxygen, not perfume, then for me that means at least five things. It means that beauty is necessary. It's not trivial or optional because it forms our lives, it forms our desires, our imaginations, our attachments. And if God is beauty, then the world that is just a creative overflow of who God is, then the world is beautiful, and that's necessary. It's just a part of our lives. So if beauty is oxygen, it's necessary. If beauty is oxygen, it means that it's everywhere. It's not just in places or situations or objects that are pleasant or nice but beauty can emerge from everything. Doesn't mean that everything is beautiful, you know, but, but beauty can emerge from every aspect of the world. Beauty is necessary, it's everywhere, and, and it's a gift. We didn't do anything to deserve the oxygen we breathe. We didn't do anything to deserve to live in a beautiful world. It's just there, and it's constantly sustaining our lives, whether we realize it or not. And then from my perspective, I think beauty is spiritual. It comes from the spirit who is the breath of God. God breathes out beauty and we breathe it in as oxygen for our lives. Fifth, beauty is dangerous. This is maybe a bit surprising to think about, but talk to any diver about oxygen and they'll tell you oxygen is important, but too much of it can be very dangerous. You get oxygen poisoning. 
And similarly for beauty, there is, there is a way for us to take it in. There's a way that's appropriate, there's a way that's inappropriate. It's only so much we can take at a certain time of a certain kind. So you might think of a story like Moses, who's wanting to see God's glory, wanting to see God's beauty, and he gets a little glimpse of his back. Why? Because the, the full brunt of that beauty, a full dose of it, would be too much. It would literally kill him. And so if we take in too much beauty too quickly, not taking time to process, enjoy it, then we can suffer a form of, of beauty poisoning. So those are just some things to get you thinking. Beauty is oxygen. It's, it's necessary. It's everywhere. It's a gift. It's spiritual. It's wonderfully dangerous. And I started thinking about beauty along these ways, particularly because we live in a time when there is a lot that makes it difficult for us to breathe. And I think we live in a soul-crushing world. And in my mind, that makes beauty even more necessary. So think about the soul-crushing disillusion of a marriage, the soul-crushing doldrums of a day job, the soul-crushing pain of disease, the soul-crushing oppression of the vulnerable, the soul-crushing loss of a child, the soul-crushing violence of racism, the soul-crushing isolation of individualism, the soul-crushing futility of advancement, the soul-crushing hatred of others, the soul-crushing abuse of the weak. And then you have Terry Tempest Williams, who says, the world is so beautiful despite the troubles. And that's it. Beauty is oxygen for a soul-crushing existence. Beauty blows through nauseous, noxious environments, nestling me everywhere. If only we have eyes to see, ears to hear, noses to smell, tongues to taste, hands to touch. Beauty, beauty permeates our lives, that is to say our souls, through every sense. It shimmers through every crack, sounds through every silence, wafts down every street, lingers after every sip, radiates from every surface. The soul-sustaining music of birdsong, the soul-sustaining aroma of a warm spring rain, the soul-sustaining bond between friends, the soul-sustaining wonder of grace, the soul-sustaining silliness of children, the soul-sustaining horizon of the ocean, the soul-sustaining joy of a wedding feast, the soul-sustaining energy of a jazz quartet, the soul-sustaining ache of belly laughter, the soul-sustaining warmth of a winter fire. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Ecclesiastes 3. So those are some of the ways I think about why beauty is so necessary. And I started thinking about beauty in this way, using this metaphor, about seven years ago. I was pastoring a church in Charlotte, and we endured a particularly difficult year as a community. We experienced the death of a founding leader by motorcycle accident, the death of a teenage son of an elder of the church, via suicide, the death of uh, a, a young campus minister by blood clot, uh, the death of an elderly woman in the congregation through health complications. It's just it's like we were getting pummeled from every side. There was those deaths and there was other things going on in the church. It was just an excruciatingly difficult year. And individually uh, and, and communally, I just had a very strong sense that what we really need is, is beauty. We need more beauty. And, and so I did this teaching series called Soul Pollution. And, and I explored various ways in which our, our lives, our souls get clogged up and polluted by things. Yes, tragedy, suffering, but uh, consumerism and, and boredom and these things, and, and explore how beauty is oxygen for, for a polluted life, for, for a polluted soul. 
And it really resonated with our community and it, it brought me a lot of life during a time that was very difficult. And, and then it sort of just went aside for a while and, until five years later, I thought, I, I can't leave this thought. I just need to write more about it. And, and that's when I started writing this book and, and started to flesh out a little bit more how beauty is oxygen for our lives when it seems like we live in a time when faith, hope, and love are increasingly difficult. For a variety of reasons, our cultural condition has us here. And, and so um, I started thinking about these various conditions, the buffered condition, and a battered condition, and a bored condition, these things that I think anybody experiences in, in this context in the 21st century. So I call these conditions buffered, battered and bored. I originally had them in the subtitle and my editor was like, look, alliterations are dumb. We're not going to use that. But, but I was a pastor. Like, I, I use alliterations all the time. Um, so it's not in the subtitle, but it, it's, it's woven in and through the book. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of, of framework for thinking, uh, for following my thought of how I think about this. Um, so just a little on each of those. So by buffered self, I mean we live in a time in which, for many people, it seems very impossible to believe that there is a God who could be present and active in the world. Um, and, and that creates a situation in which what I have is me, and I have the pressure and the opportunity to find my own way, to make my own meaning. And um, in that buffered condition, buffered from you know, transcendent realities, um, faith is not so much trusting in something outside of me, but trusting that, that I'm enough, that I'm enough to figure this out. And, and the, the buffered self is, is this cultural condition then um, that intersects in the Christian tradition with, with a um, a, a sin condition of sort of being curved in on yourself, of being self-preoccupied uh, rather than oriented outward in attentiveness and love um, toward others. In that scenario, the power of beauty is to unself us, to get us from this self-preoccupied state, this buffered state, to a state where we're, we're curved outward in love and attention and wonder and, and beauty has the power uh, to at least open us to the possibility of transcendence and provide that bridge to a wonder-making God. So that's the buffered self and kind of the struggle of faith. The, the battered self is simply trying to navigate a world with the traumas that we carry from all the various wounds, from the racial traumas, the environmental traumas, the the relational traumas, the political traumas, and it's our souls crying out for hope, uh, for freedom from, from these various traumas that, that just constrict our airways and make it difficult to breathe in life. And for the battered soul, what I'm suggesting is that beauty can bring hope and beauty can actually bring healing. And then the bored self is kind of the result of the first two of if, if it's just me, myself, and I trying to make a way through the world, and if I'm just getting battered from all these different directions, then what's the point anymore? And what's getting me up every day? And what kind of meaning do I find in the routines and in my job and in the work of my hands? And so we, we try to address boredom, right, through entertainment and through busyness. But what we really long for is joy and beauty in the everyday, right? Not as an extraordinary thing, but as just the thing we encounter on the street and over meals and in conversations and in relationship with, with others. So, so deep down, I think, in our experience of boredom is this desire to experience um, love, kind of others-centeredness. Um, and that begins with attention and astonishment, I think, to ordinary people, ordinary moments, ordinary places, all of which is really quite extraordinary. But that's my filter, buffered, battered, and bored. Take it or leave it. If you like the alliteration, great. If not, I'm sorry. 
and try to summarize that a little bit at the end of chapter one. So I'll, I'll read these paragraphs. Beauty is oxygen for people who struggle to find meaning beyond the self, coming like a fresh breeze into the suffocating atmosphere of me, myself, and I. To encounter the beauty of any kind, whether in creation or the arts, is an opportunity to experience a radical unselfing. While encounters with beauty can have deep emotional impact, beauty is far more than therapeutic. It moves us beyond self-centeredness, liberates us from illusions of control, and brings us into transformative encounters with a transcendent God who draws near within our material world. Beauty is oxygen for people who struggle to find and maintain hope. True beauty is not sentimental. It carries along with it the wounds of our existence, as we see in the person of Christ. In a time of racialized violence, environmental crisis, and growing inequalities, the beauty of the arts and creation can bear witness to a weighty, anchored hope, one that does not evade the reality of evil and injustice. So beauty can awaken us to see things as they currently are while giving glimpses of how things could and will be. These visions activate our imaginations and collective will for costly action within situations of oppression, suffering, trauma, and injustice. And finally, beauty is oxygen for people who struggle with boredom and find little to love with abandon. Beauty allows us to breathe deeply within ordinary times and places. Rather than moving from one meaningless day and season to another, we can be filled with wonder when we are alert to the beauty of creation and the glory of ordinary things. As one poet writes, there is a dearest freshness deep down things, despite that all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil. And we can see via beauty how each day is caught up in this cosmic drama of loss and renewal. Uh, and it leads us into that as well. So that's the, the, the big idea of the book, why beauty is oxygen and some, some of the reason why I think that's important as we seek to live out faith, hope, and love today. Um, I intentionally, I'm a theologian, so it was hard for me to do this, but I intentionally do not linger on what beauty is. <laughs> It's very frustrating for some people, and I get that. Sorry if, if you're one of them. But I do that because a lot of, of theologians just can't get past that. Uh, it's so interesting to them, and I find it interesting too. Like, you don't get past the, these discussions about what, what beauty is. And I really wanted to write a book based on my experience about what beauty does, what, what the impact of beauty is. So. Uh, I address a little bit of what beauty is in the introduction, and I've hinted that, at that already. I think beauty is God. I think the world is the overflow of God's beauty, and so anything beautiful we encounter are these traces of divine glory, whether that's in, in people or in you know, art or creation, and, and beauty has, has this, uh, this alluring entanglement of differences. That, that draw us to it. Um, so I talk about that a little bit. But the main point that I, wanted to come, that I wanted to emphasize anytime I talk about what beauty is, is um, that it's not merely what we like or what we find pleasant or nice. Uh, that's the trap of sentimentality, and I think it's a major trap within religious traditions, within the Christian tradition, and just in our society today as a whole. So I'm going to turn to page 67 and read a few sections about that. Uh, by the way, if you've picked up the book already, you've noticed this. If you haven't, um, it's written in vignettes or little um, snippets with the symbol, symbol for oxygen in between each snippet to, to invite you to, to slow down a little bit, take some deep breaths as you read, also to, to free me from creating connective tissue between my often varied and random and disconnected experience of beauty in the world. I wanted the, the, the experience of reading the book to match kind of how we encounter beauty in these bursts and moments and snippets in our life. So, 
I keep thinking about how genuine beauty has bite and grit. Something that hits you in the gut instead of always eliciting pleasant feelings. I think of the magnificent beauty of God that the psalmist says shines forth with fire and tempest. I think of the entangled beauty of nature that depends on an endless cycle of life and death and rebirth. I think of the intimate beauty of a relationship that navigates through the choppy, nauseating waters of conflict only to arrive on the other side, somehow more whole and vibrant. Can you tell that I'm married? My wife is here tonight. <laughs> is that true? I hope it's true. <clears throat> I think of the mysterious and terrifying beauty of a black hole. <laughs> what is that, right? This is not safe. Uh, I think of the uncontrollable beauty of my children that makes my heart ache because I know their hearts will break. I think of the sacrificial beauty of a God who's broken for us and enters the abyss. So Mary Oliver wrote, the beauty and strangeness of the world may fill the eyes with its cordial refreshment. Equally, it may offer the heart a dish of terror. There's, there's the danger in beauty again. So on one side is radiance, on another is the abyss. And as a Christian, this is not a strange idea to me <laughs> because we have the radiance of a resurrected Christ emerging from the dark abyss of death. This is, this is madness and it's wonderful. This is what beauty is. And it may seem like a contradiction, but our experience of beauty can include what Christian Wyman calls a bright abyss. So we can encounter beauty, therefore, in the midst of trauma and brokenness. And beauty can lead us beyond trauma and brokenness, can, can provide gifts of, of hope and healing and meaning in the midst of, of all of that. And I write about this, pages 83 and 84. Why do we need beauty most of all when battered and traumatized? The answer is as complex as the trauma, which is essentially the ugly stories that we believe and inhabit and embody because of painful, horrific experiences, right? So trauma is not merely something bad that happened in our past. It's the lingering experience of those things in the present that permeates our body and life. Um, and as image bearers of God, we are beauty breathing beings. But what trauma does is it narrows those airways as well as the attachments through which we experience beauty. An Orthodox theologian, Timothy Petitsas, explains it this way. He says, in trauma, we find our lives organized around an experience of ugliness, which is the opposite of the beauty given to us in our relationship with God. So essentially, we're cut off from epiphanies that keep our soul awake and breathing. And we're trapped in this life-diminishing prison of ugliness. So exposure to beauty, I don't want to claim as a cure-all for traumatized and battered souls, but it is an essential component of any holistic healing. So medicine can unlock our brains from debilitating conditions, but beauty draws us into healthy attachments. Analytical modes of therapy can help dismantle false narratives and nurture new ones, but it's beauty that awakens new loves and desires. Petites us again. The healing of the soul begins with noticing God's many theophanies and falling in love with them. In other words, it begins with the eros of beauty and renewing our love for authentic beauty. Our character, unraveled by what we have experienced, begins to be knit together and becomes whole again. And that's it. We need beauty to breathe and be fully alive. And there are several practices I, I talk about in the book, uh, particularly in the book on uh, the everyday struggles of, of boredom and meaninglessness. And I just want to introduce you to one tonight um, later on in the book. So this is page 110. I talk about the practice of breath prayers. So I want to set that up with this section here. Uh, Rachel Carson, 
Any of you know Rachel Carson? Oh, wonderful, wonderful voice. She shares that if she were a magical fairy, she would give to all children, quote, a sense of wonder so indestructible that it will last throughout life as an unfailing antidote to boredom and disenchantments of later years, sterile preoccupation with things that are artificial, and the alienation from sources of strength. <laughs> That's amazing. But we can't count on magical fairies to show up. And so I, I talk about cultivating wonder habits. So if beauty is oxygen, think of wonder as your diaphragm. Wonder is what keeps your lungs breathing in beauty. It's, and it's a habit. It's a discipline that will see us through times of disenchantment. And lots of practices can help us strengthen our wonder muscle. And, and for me, one of those is breath prayer. So breath prayer is uh, simply a holy pause in your day. Uh, it increases your capacity for wonder. So for example, before going into a meeting, here's one that I introduce, you could pause and on the inhale say, attune my senses to the beauty of this meeting. That's it. We might need to do it 20 times. <laughs> but, you know, that's it. Simple, simple practice. Tune my senses to the beauty of this meeting. And, and this is a prayer that's helped me show up to meetings, not as a taskmaster, but as a beauty beholder and a beauty chaser. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the coworker who annoyed me at the last meeting will miraculously cease to annoy me or that the conversation will be fascinating, but it does help me walk into the room with a little bit more wonder and helps me be attentive to the beauty of my fellow human beings and our ways of interacting and the energy of the spirit in our midst. And you can do this at any transition in your day, whether you are a religious person, Christian person or not, you can have a practice of pausing and saying, attune my senses, to the beauty of this moment. Um, if you are a Christian, it'd be very powerful to incorporate breath prayers into praying the portions of the day, praying the hours of the day, and you do that as much as you need to because we need training, we need discipline, we need wonder habits to help us be attentive to the beauty that is around us all the time. It's not, not the issue with, with beauty, it's the issue with us and, and showing up to it. So, um, how much time do I have, Kirk? How long have I been going? A little bit more, five minutes? Yeah. Okay. So, buffered, battered, bored. One chapter sets up the problem. The next chapter addresses how beauty enters into that part of our lives. Then at the end of the book, the last chapter, I talk about the power of beauty to save the world, which is a grandiose statement, and it comes from Dostoevsky. Well, we think it comes from Dostoevsky. It doesn't really, it's never stated in Dostoevsky. It's in The Idiot, wonderful novel, and it comes first as a question. So there's this interaction between Ippolit, he's an atheist, and Prince Mishkin, and, and Ippolit is querying uh, because he thinks that, that Prince Mishkin only believes beauty will save the world because he's in love. And he wants to, he wants to critique that. <laughs> and so he says, is it true that you once said that beauty will save the world? Okay, so it's a question, never stated. Prince Mishkin doesn't answer it. He goes down several different paths. And, but then Ippolit comes at it again. And here's the question I like. What sort of beauty will save the world? That's the question he, he eventually asks. And I think that's the right question. It's a great question. Don't assume it, but if beauty could save the world, what sort of beauty would do that? And Dostoevsky is such a master that, you know, it's not answered in the book. <laughs> it's just it riddled, you know. Um, and beauty should, should remain a riddle to some extent. Um, but I had to finish the book with some kind of answers, some kind of direction. So I, I try to address this a little bit. Let me read just a few pages. Let's see, uh, page 123. So I think, I think what sort of beauty? There's two, two different ways we can approach that. So to begin, I think it's fitting to talk about 
the power of natural and artistic beauty to save us now from, from a meaningless, despairing experience in this life. And I think this is likely what Mary Oliver, Oliver meant when in this wonderful interview with Krista Tippett, man, please listen to it if you haven't heard Mary Oliver talking to Krista Tippett. Uh, but she says, I got saved by poetry. I got saved by the beauty of the world. And she's talking about how despite a really difficult childhood, first the beauty of the woods and then the beauty of words gave her purpose, gave her something to live for, and, and actually motivated her to bring more beauty in the world through her own poetry, her own writing. Um, and, and for beauty to save the world in this way is, is just to claim natural and artistic beauty as oxygen for a life of meaning and joy. Now, despite all the troubles, uh, beauty won't magically erase trauma and pain, but it can give strength for each day. Beauty won't eliminate injustice, but it can provide hope beyond current circumstances. Beauty won't ease all the tensions of a buffered life, but it can introduce a sense of wonder and enchantment as a bridge to the sacred. And in this sense, beauty can save any person at any time. And every time it does, the world looks and feels a little bit brighter. So Cole Arthur Riley writes that beauty in this way is a force of liberation, and I could not agree more. And I think we've all had these experiences. However, we might identify them with the presence and action of God. Uh, you know, I had a spot that I would go growing up. I grew up in, in central Minnesota on 160 acres, and I, I didn't have any kind of, of trauma like I think Mary Oliver experienced as a child, but things were tough at times, and I needed to get out, I needed to get out of the house, and I would, I would run up Scenic Slope through the Burr Oaks and the Norway Pines uh, up to the top of this hill, and there was a big slab of granite, and I would sit on that spot on the top of Scenic Slope and just slowly feel more myself, slowly breathe in the beauty around me. And it, it felt like being saved by beauty. Like when I heard Mary Oliver say that, um, I get it. And, and I think perhaps we all have had experiences or spots like that. So creation can do this. And artistic beauty can have a similar impact, especially in a context, as one theologian writes, that's replete with a, a growing recognition of unsettling contingency, the gnawing of dis-ease, the erosion of old certainties, and the despoilation of hope. And this theologian is quick to point out that art is never a, some sort of messianic fix or a panacea for the greater demons of our nature, but it can provide at least a point of departure, a way to not simply bandage the wounds of victims beneath the wheels of injustice, but to drive a lance or even throw oneself into the spokes of the wheel itself. And even if art can't save us or the world from ultimate demise, it can save us from apathy and resignation. So think of what novelist and poet Erica Young expresses in this poem. This is a, a poem called Picking Up My Pen Again. She says, no poem will unwrite lawsuits, unseat senators, or unbribe judges. No poem will ungrow cancer, yet we still write poems as leaves give oxygen so we can breathe. So there's that sense that I want you to consider, how beauty of creation, beauty of the arts, can make this life worth living. And if that's true, if beauty can save a soul from despair, can it also save us from more? Can it save us from the curse of death, even? And, and most theologians will deny this possibility, especially if by beauty we mean the beauty of created things. So the beauty of nature or the beauty of artistry. According to N.T. Wright, for example, the beauty of created things can't save us, but it's a broken signpost of one who can. Consequently, if we look to create a beauty to save our souls rather than a creator, we will be constantly dissatisfied and misled by idolatry. C.S. Lewis famously talked about this as well. He says that we have this longing for created beauty, but that reveals this underlying desire for what he called a distant country, one in which we will become the splendor we experience 
in the here and now. And another, Chris Green writes that, like all created things, beauty given or made must be saved from itself and from us in order to be given back to us as oxygen for our souls. So in other words, what these theologians are saying is, look, only God can save us from ultimate tragedy. But what if God is beauty? And what if God is more identified with these beautiful things than we often acknowledge? What if the big transcendent God is also the God who is intimate and present and imminent in the world? If that's true, then in the extent to which God is beauty, then yes, the world will be saved by beauty, which in this case is the beauty of an eternal being who is simultaneously beautifier, beauty, and beautifulness. And this beauty exists beyond the world, but also enters the world, as we see in the person of Jesus, who lived a beautiful life, died this horrific death, rose again, ascended to heaven, and sent the Spirit to bring a whole new creation to life. So if this is the sort of beauty that will save the world, then it changes our perspective. This is a, a Trinitarian beauty, a revealed beauty, incarnate beauty, cruciform beauty, resurrected beauty, ascended beauty, spirited beauty, and it's foolishness, really, um, to consider, because this is the kind of beauty that goes belonging to death as well as life. But Chris Green again says, there can be no redemption without the death of beauty in hell. And if this is true, then the world will be saved by identifying with that beauty and dying and rising to life with it. So that's a lot to consider, but consider this, that the salvation that will be revealed in the future is already available now as God's beauty whispers and roars through this world in both ordinary and surprising ways. This is the beauty that entices us to believe and move us beyond the suffocating boundaries of a buffered existence into a life of faith, grace, and joy. This is the beauty that brings hope and healing despite all the troubles and the trauma we carry. And this is the beauty that stirs up wonder within our ordinary and monotonous lives, compelling us to risk more love and creativity. Beauty is oxygen, and there's more than enough to go around.